After returning to Las Vegas from the Lodge Championship Series, we're heading to the Wynn where I've been having lots of success the last six months. Not only do they have the nicest overall property on the Las Vegas Strip, they've also got by far the nicest poker room where I intend to spend a lot more time. Today we've got plans to play the 510 game with a 3k cap, but the table's full at the moment so we hop into the 2-5 game initially. It's a $1500 max buy-in, that's what we've got in front of us when we start the session at 2.59pm. Just a few minutes in, we've got 10-9 suited under the gun plus one. I raised to 15. The middle position player, the cutoff, and big blind all call. We're going four ways to the flop. It comes a7-4 rainbow. We've got a lot of nothing except some backdoor draws. We all check. I've been honing in my psychic abilities. I think to myself that the eight of hearts would be a very cool card to see. Then it appears, making it so a lot of rivers should give us the winner. The big blind checks. We're gonna semi-bluff this one. I bet 35. No one's willing to fold. All three opponents call. This is making me concerned that our flush draw may not be good if we get there. The dealer puts out the jack of hearts, giving us the flush and the straight for fun. The big blind checks. Despite being worried that the 10 high flush might not be the best hand, I bet 115. If we get raised after betting into three opponents on the turn and the river, I'll reluctantly fold. I wouldn't mind getting called in one spot. The opponents all fold though. We go run a runner to make a big hand and win a pot right off the bat. We're off to a good start. Next we've got the Jiggities and the Big Blind. The $10 straddles on, under the gun plus one limps in. I've already seen him open limp a few times. It seems to be his thing. Small blind calls with a relatively short stack. We have a hand that we don't want to go multi-way with. I raised to 65. Winning what's already in the middle right now wouldn't be too bad of a result. That won't be happening. The under the gun plus one limper calls. The small blind calls as well, with only 230 remaining in his stack. The flop comes 10-5-4 rainbow. Not too much to be worried about other than the opponents having sets. Small blind checks. Non-paired 10 high flops are dynamic, meaning it's likely there will be a lead change at some point as overcards come out or straight draws complete. I'd like to take this one down immediately if possible. I bet 130. Under the gun plus one, it doesn't even consider folding. It's tough to know what types of hands he's limping in with since open limping is an unorthodox strategy. The opponent calls. Maybe he has aces, but he probably would have three bet with rockets after I made it 65 preflop or raised on the flop. He could have some tens in his range that were beating. He could also have some small pocket pairs that are now sets. What adds to my fear regarding this hand is that the small blind calls for more than half of his stack. I have no idea what the hell these two guys are doing after limp calling 65 and then calling a fairly large flop bet, but here we are going three ways to the turn and it's the ace of clubs. It's towards the top of the list of cards I didn't want to see come out because we're losing to hands like ace 10. To make things even stranger, small blind lead jams for only $100. Did he outflop us or get there on the turn against us? Is he making some kind of strange bluff because he doesn't know what to do with a hand like king 10? I don't have all the answers, but I'm getting somewhere in the vicinity of a trillion to one, so I can't fold. I call, even with another player behind me. Under the gun plus one still doesn't want to fold after seeing an all-in and a call. I don't know what he has, but I don't blame him since he's getting a great price as well. He calls. Guys, it's going to be unlikely that we win this one. The river is another ace. I actually love seeing that card because now it's less likely that one of our opponents is holding an ace since half of them are accounted for. There's a dry side pot, I check, under the gun plus one, checks it back, we turn over, wait, no we don't, under the gun plus one turns over his cards first, he has queen 10 suited, we had him beat the whole way, but it doesn't matter because the small blind got there on the turn with ace three suited, and then he river trips, just to rub it in everyone's face how good he runs, what a jerk. We don't win the pot, and that's unfortunate, we can't get two down though because we do finish in second place, that's nearly as good just comes with a lot less money and by that I mean it comes with none. At this time we get called for the 510 game that I've been excited about. I add on for 1700 more to get us to the 3k max. We find our new table and take a seat then before we even get dealt a hand we see that the high stakes uncapped 1020 game is getting started. There are a few people that I don't recognize buying in which is normally a sign of a great game because it means they're probably out of town visitors were there to have a good time rather than pros. I see a host tending to one of the players that I don't recognize, which is an even better sign. If a casino host has been assigned to him, he must be an avid gambler. I had no intentions of playing higher stakes games today. I had a late flight from Austin to Las Vegas the night before, and I'm not as sharp as I could be. Still, 
this might be the best 10-20 lineup that I've ever seen in Las Vegas. I'm an opportunist. I bring my sack to the new table where we'll be battling for a lot more money. I add on for an additional 5,000 at first, then after only a few minutes and seeing how big some of the other stacks are, I add on for 10,000 on top of that. I'm in for 18,200 total on the day. Some newly acquired yellow chips are brought to us just in time to get involved in a hand as we look down at King Jack of Diamonds and the hijack. The under the gun player limps in, he's the one with the casino host, he's got a big stack, and he's here with a buddy of his who's on his right in the big blind. Under the gun plus one raises to 80, potentially to isolate the limper. Three betting and calling are both reasonable. I call, the big blind calls for 60 more, he's never played poker in a casino before, and isn't exactly sure what's going on. His buddy's doing his best to explain in Mandarin where the action is, what his options are, and how much he needs to put in the middle if he wants to proceed after someone's bet. Everyone at the table is happy to be patient. It's very rare that someone who's new to the game is playing high stakes. But these guys seem to be very wealthy and are likely extremely successful in other business ventures. Several thousand dollars doesn't appear to be a lot of money for them. Under the gun also calls, we're going four ways to the flop. It comes queen four three with two hearts and a diamond. We've got some backdoor draws and one over. Checks to the initial preflop raiser, he bets 170. We're in position and have a lot of cards that can help us improve, including any diamond, an ace, king, jack, 10, or nine. I call one to see what develops. The big blind and under the gun both call. We're all still in it. The turn is the six of hearts. It's scary since the front door flush gets there and some straights get there. The big blind open folds, which you don't typically see after calling a bet on the flop. It's a bold strategy. Perhaps he knows something that I don't. Checks to us. We're going to be done with this one. We're not bluffing into multiple opponents when we could be drawing dead. I check back. The river is the king of spades, giving us top pair. I take it back. We're not done. Under the gun is going to be charging us if we want to get to showdown. He bets 360. It's not a large bet compared to the size of the pot. Maybe he wants a call. Maybe he wants to get to showdown cheaply with a queen. Under the gun plus one reluctantly calls. I don't get the sense that he has much. Our top pair could be best. I call. We're not best. We're not even close. Under the gun takes me to value town with ace eight of hearts for the flush. He gets the win after drilling the turn, making his friends open fold on that street even more impressive and a little suspect. We're a bit stuck when we pick up pocket nines under the gun plus one. Under the gun raises to 100. He's first to act and opening to a large amount, I just call. The small blind is the opponent who beat us with the ace high flush, he three bets to 600. The big blind cold calls, under the gun calls for 500 more, we're getting a great price with a hand that plays well multi-way, I also call for 500 more. We're going four ways to the flop, in position, it comes jack nine three rainbow, we've got middle set and a three bet pot with multiple opponents, it's a dream setup. The three better may not have much, he checks. That's disappointing because I was already envisioning him doubling us up. The big blind checks, then under the gun checks. They may all have air. They're not going to see a free card though. I bet 1400 for value. The small blind is either passing a kidney stone or really doesn't like facing a bet. He exposes pocket deuces and folds face up. I want to bet that game. But, oh, 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 still players. Still players. Oh, 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 sorry, 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 sorry. We're in quite the game today. The big blind folds as well. Under the gun is our last hope to make some additional money. He doesn't let us down. He calls with only 1970 behind. I'm surprised that he didn't shove with whatever he has. We're heads up. The turn is the eight of clubs, so the most obvious draw gets there to take the lead against us. And I think it's somewhat likely that the opponent could be holding queen 10, but there are a variety of other worse hands that he could still have. And the pot is so large, especially compared to the under the gun's remaining stack, that we won't let that concern us too much. The opponent checks. We don't want this board to get any worse for us or scarier for our opponent, making him feel less inclined to put more chips in the middle. There's only one move to make, and that's to rip it. All in. Call. All in and call. Can you turn? Yeah. All right. Once, twice, or once? Uh, let's go once. Just once. Give it to him. Motherfucker. I mean, I do have a girlfriend with two children, but I had no idea that he knew that, and it seems like an odd time to discuss it. We get rewarded for running it one time, as we boat up to scoop a pot of over $9,000. We're no longer stuck. We're up several thousand on the day. Less than 10 minutes later, we pick up King 3 of Diamonds in the cutoff. The VIP raises a 60 from under the gun plus one. Ordinarily, I'd fold a weak suited king to an open, 
but this is a unique set of circumstances in which we're playing over a thousand big blinds effective with a hand that has potential to win a big pot while we're in position against the person we're at the table for. I call, the bud may have the same idea as me, he calls, the big blind defends, we're going four ways to the flop, it comes jack nine eight with two diamonds, we've got the king high flush draw, one over, and a backdoor straight draw. The big blind checks, under the gun plus one likes what he sees, he bets 240. That price is fine with me. I call with aspirations of winning a five figure pot. The button calls. The big blind also calls. We're all still in it. The turn is the 10 of clubs putting four to the straight on board. The big blind checks. Under the gun plus one slows down and also checks. We pick up the gutter and almost more importantly have removal of the king queen making it a lot less likely that if we bet here we'd get raised. I take a stab betting 600. This gives us control of the pot it opens up doors for us to either win this right now and get folds out of hands as good as two pair or even the bottom end of the straight, but if not, we build the pot in case we can hit a diamond. It looks really strong that we're betting into three players, but after under the gun plus one checks, he won't have the queen high straight very frequently, so I'm mostly concerned only about getting through the button and the big blind. After tanking for quite a while, the button folds. The big blind folds as well. It's back on the initial preflop raiser who I've already deemed to be weak. He calls though. He may just have one pair that he isn't willing to give up just yet to one bet. It's down to heads up. Any queen or diamond would be amazing. The dealer puts out the four of spades. It's the least fun card in the deck. The opponent checks. Ordinarily, I'd continue firing as a bluff with little hesitation, but against recreational players that have lots of cash and don't mind losing it, bluffing isn't the best strategy because these types of opponents love calling and getting to showdown. It's much better to bet big for value against them rather than make big bluff attempts. We already saw that this player seemed to be in agony, folding an underpair to the board with deuces earlier. Still, this is the only way that we can win the pot, and I'm nearly certain that he doesn't have a straight. I'm going for it. We need to determine a good size that'll make it look like we're strong and are trying to get max value. I bet 1700. This should be enough to worry the opponent that we've got a queen. Betting more probably wouldn't add to the effectiveness. In fact, if I bet more, it might look more like I'm bluffing and make the opponent more curious, perhaps inducing lighter calls. 1700 is appropriate to maximize effectiveness while risking less money. Under the gun plus one is taking a sweet time on this. I'm already regretting making the bet because the longer he takes, the more I feel like he's gonna talk himself into a call. But wait, he grabs his cards as if he's gonna muck. Then he takes them back. Now he's counting out chips to make the call. He doesn't do that either though. He goes through this routine a few times. I don't blame him for thinking it over thoroughly. A minute and a half goes by. Then the opponent calls. I show him that I bluffed away the majority of the profit that I just got. King high is not gonna be good enough to win. I have two bears. Nice hand, nice hand. Mm. Nice call, nice try. Nice try. <laughs> my attempt is unsuccessful as I suspected it might be. I just couldn't get myself to check back. The button would later tell me that he flopped a straight with 10-7 suited and folded the low end of the straight to our turn bet. It's too bad that we weren't able to get 9-8 to fold on the turn or the river. Now we're much closer to even, but the VIP is at least having a great time. I tried to. I couldn't. Here we've got pocket nines under the gun plus one. They were good to us earlier. Let's see if we can replicate that magic. I raise a 60. The button calls. The small blind is our boy who just picked us off. He calls. The big blind calls as well. We're going four ways to the flop. It comes king-queen seven with two hearts. We've got third pair and very little hope to improve. We all check. The turn is the nine of hearts giving us another set. Small blind checks. The big blind goes with a large sizing of 170. There's almost no chance that this is a bluff. He's betting into multiple opponents with straight and flush possibilities out there. He's gonna have a lot of combos containing two hearts in this range when he defends his big blind. I play this on the conservative side and I call to see if we can maybe river a full house again. The button folds. We already know that the small blind hates giving up. He calls. It's down to three of us. I activate my psychic abilities once more and induce the seven of spades to come out. It's the best board pairing card other than a nine because there's a small possibility that we're up against king queen, so another king or queen could have been bad. We should have the winner unless we're up against a straight flush or quads. If that's the case, we're gonna lose the max. Small blind checks. Our hand strength is pretty concealed after we check the flop and only call it on the turn. The big blind is comfortable betting. He makes it 350, presumably for value. Less than 15 minutes ago, I just got caught bluffing, depleting all my credibility, but I'm a former accountant. 
I allocated that loss to a marketing expense in order to help me get paid when I've got the goods, like right now. I'm gonna go with a big raise size to target straights, flushes, or maybe even worse full houses. I'm about to make it 1600, then the small blind gets bored and attempts to fold out a turn. Hold on, hold on, hold on. While it may seem bad to know that one of our opponents is folding, I'm actually okay with it because I suspected he'd be folding to a raise anyway. I've mostly been thinking about how much the big blind would be willing to call and an out of turn fold from the small blind should allow us to get paid even easier. I increased the price and raised to 1800 to make it look even more like a bluff. The small blind folds as expected, in my opponent's mind, I could be thinking that it's more likely I'm bluffing since I raised knowing that I didn't have to worry about the small blind calling. The big blind is in the tank, it's a raise of over 5 times his bet that he's facing. It looks like I could be turning a hand like ace jack offsuit with the ace of hearts into a bluff. He knows that I'm capable. The opponent has around 5,500 total, he doesn't appear to be contemplating a fold, he might be contemplating a jam. If he gets a count of his chips, he may have us beat somehow. I won't be able to get away from a full house here. Almost two minutes after we announce our bet, the opponent calls. Like Bob Barker in a showcase showdown, we reveal a boat. The opponent can't believe that we went runner runner to pull up right on the shore of Value Town to drop him off. We've got the winner. We never see what the opponent had, but he probably called us with King Queen, Jack 10, or a flush. This win gets us up about 2,500 for the day. Let's keep it going. Next, we've got Ace King offsuit in the big blind. The straddle is on to 40. The hijack raises to 120. He's a good pro. The small blind calls. We've got a three bet this. I make it 600. The initial pre flop raiser calls. The small blind folds. We're heads up out of position. The flop comes 5 3 3 with two hearts. We've got two overs and backdoor draws. This is an interesting situation because we're the preflop aggressor and we have potential. I'd like to keep control of the pot by firing again to possibly win immediately, but most of the hands that we're beating, like low to medium pocket pairs, are going to call at least one bet, so we might have to double barrel. I bet 800. They should mostly get folds from hands like suited Broadway cards and smaller suited connectors that don't contain hearts or diamonds. The opponent calls without thinking too long about it. It feels like we're up against 8s or 9s with a heart. The turn is the four of hearts, we pick up the king high flush draw and the wheel draw. If I check, I'll definitely be calling a bet, so I may as well force my opponent to make a tough decision when I put money in the middle. I bet 1900. They should start folding out hands containing two diamonds and pocket eights. The opponent is taking his time thinking about what decision to make. I've been playing live poker since I was 15 and I'm 35 now. This is when having that experience watching people helps because it appears that the hijack is genuinely debating between multiple options, and it looks like he doesn't really like any of them. A minute and a half later, the opponent raises to 5,200. This is very bizarre. The opponent has about 14,000 total. If he has what he's representing, which is the ace high flush, a full house, or better, I'd expect him to flat and let me bluff off another huge portion of my stack on the river. When he raises here, it feels much more like some sort of bluff with either ace queen or ace king offsuit containing the ace of hearts. Or maybe he doesn't know what to do with a hand like pocket nines or pocket tens with the heart and wants to see where he's at. He could be raising with a smaller flush, but we have the king of hearts blocker, making those less likely. When I narrow his range down to mostly hands that are either semi-bluffing or won't want to see this pocket any bigger, it makes me want to stick around. The main issue is that we only have ace high at the moment, and there's only one card to come. My instincts are that my opponent isn't strong enough to withstand a re-raise. He only has 9,000 on top of the 5,200 that he already put in the middle. Our hand should theoretically be a fold. I'm deviating. I'm going with the read. Have you covered? I didn't add on 15,000 for show. I did it to put those chips to use, and that's what we're doing now. We fade the snap call, so we're not up against the full house with the ace high flush. This is very important because it means that we either have a ton of outs against the middling pocket pair type of hand, including any heart, ace, king, or deuce. Or ace king offsuit could even be best if we're up against ace queen offsuit with the ace of hearts. Regardless of what the opponent chooses to do, I'm taking some solace in the fact that I put him to the test. Even if he has the queen high flush, he's not going to be fist pump getting it in for an additional $9,000. That sort of hand will still be forced to call. Plenty of time has elapsed now, so I don't suspect that that's what the opponent has. He likely has something much weaker. A minute and 40 seconds later, we finally hear from the opponent. There was one seat. Alright, that was a good one. Yeah. Nice. I think you play better live cash games than get on those. 
Maybe. I should just jam. Force you to make the call. Uh, jam on the guy for fourteen k. We get perhaps the most exciting 3-bet bluff shove through in my life to be up almost $10,000 on the session. The read won't be right all the time, but this is when playing nosebleed games at the lodge and in a few other sessions helps me out the most. It allows me to be more comfortable making plays like this when I feel like it's going to work. We earn this 5k chip by risking everything when the opponent says that he should have jammed over my $1,900 bet to make me make the decision. He's indicating that he probably did have either ace king or ace queen offsuit with the ace of hearts. An hour later, we've got pocket tens under the gun. The game has been officially changed to 10, 20, 40. I raised a 110. Even though that we raised from early position, the small blind puts in a three bet to 500 and only started the hand with 4,000. This isn't the VIP anymore. All the players that I originally came to the table to play with have left and their seats have been filled with some of the best pros in town. I'm currently in the bottom half when it comes to skill level at the table. The small blind is supposed to be three betting a narrow range or folding, but his bluff hands are mostly going to consist of suited tens like king 10, queen 10, and jack 10. The fact that we're holding two tens removes a lot of the bluff combos that he'll have. I call for 390 more, mostly to set mine. We're heads up in a big pot in position looking for a 10 high flop. Instead, the dealer puts out ace jack 8 with two hearts. We brick it hard and now have third pair with no backdoor flush draw. Small blind bets 340 into over a thousand. It's a small sizing, but there aren't any clean turns that we'll be all that happy with. I fold, a bit disappointed that we have to let such a strong starting hand go. The small blind is nice enough to show that we made the correct decision. Ace is wow. Nice hand, nice hand. A few minutes later, we've got ace nine offsuit in the cutoff. The last player at the table that I've got a noticeable edge on limps in for 40 from middle position. We'd like to isolate him. I raised a 140. The button calls, it's Boston Jimmy, I've known him for a long time, he just got married so congratulations to him and his wife, he's the one who organizes this game. The limper calls as well, we're going three ways to the flop, it comes ace 9 8 rainbow, we've got top two pair. The middle position player checks, there's a somewhat coordinated board, I bet 260 for value, preferably to get heads up with the middle position opponent. Boston Jimmy throws a wrench in that plan, he calls so we'll continue to play this one from out of position. We've got removal to made hands, increasing the likelihood that Jimmy could be on a straight draw, or he might have an ace or a worse pair with a backdoor draw. The middle position player folds, it's heads up, the turn is the 10 of clubs, some straights get there, and ace 10 beats us now as well. I check for pot control, we're not going to get a friends and family discount today, Jimmy bets 740. It's not fun for us, but there's no way that we're folding, we can still beat some of the hands that Jimmy might be betting for value, like ace 8, 9 8, 10 9 of hearts or spades and 9-8 suited. I call knowing that we may have to call another large bet on the ripper. The dealer puts out the five of clubs, the backdoor flush gets there, but we've got the ace of clubs. No new straights get there. I check, Jimmy's gathering chips. He keeps it reasonable though with about a 1360. It's still a significant amount. It's about how much a telecaster costs. I check to make sure that we have the ace of clubs. We do, it allows us to possibly represent the nuts with a check raise. I don't like the idea of that too much since sure it'll put the button in a tough spot no matter what he has, but I've shown bluffs a lot today already, and we still beat some worse two pair hands that our opponent could be value betting with, and we certainly beat all of his bluffs. The only purpose of turning our hand into a bluff would be to get sets or better to try and fold. If we get in the habit of trying to get our opponent to fold really strong hands, we're going to go broke quickly. I half heartedly call, knowing two pair won't always be good after there's betting on every street, doesn't work out for us this time. The opponent has pocket nines, and got a dream flop with the case nine. We're lucky not to lose a lot more money on that one. Now that the game isn't as good and some pots have gone the other way, it's time to book a nice win and call it a day. That's it for this one guys. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, I'd appreciate it if you hit the like and subscribe buttons. It helps out the channel a ton. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to let me know in the comment section. I'm happy to get back to you. Uh, if you're outside the US and able to play on WPT Global, be sure to sign up using the bonus code BRAD. 
That'll get you up to a $1,200 deposit match, and we're right about to run this major tournament series on there with buy-ins of all different amounts. So there's something for everyone in there, and uh, it's just gonna be a big deal and a lot of fun. I've been playing cash games in there, and uh, there is no shortage of action. People are firing away. Uh, so they're by far the softest online games I've ever seen. If you're able to play, be sure to take advantage of it and use that bonus code, Brad. Um, I'm here, I've had an eventful day here at uh, Gardens for the WPT for the live series. Uh, just played the $600 satellite and it's a milestone mystery bounty, which is a really, really cool hybrid. So I got to the 200K milestone and earned my seat and uh, they're still battling behind me. A couple other people still need to earn their seats, but um, it, it's just been really awesome. We had the meetup game yesterday. Anyway, uh, hope you're all doing well. Hope you're staying safe. Good luck at the tables and I'll see you next time.